Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosie Bennyworth. I'm the Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care and really pleased that you've been able to join us this afternoon to talk about the CQC's uh, new transitional regulatory approach and our future strategy. Um, I'm joined this afternoon by John Milne, who many of you will know, who is our Senior National Dental Advisor. And between the two of us, we're going to do a little bit of a double act um, to give you some information and hopefully answer all the questions that you've got for us. Um, so if I could go to the next slide, please, Steph. Um, just firstly, we have a little team of people behind the scenes here. Um, we will try and make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible. We're all um, managing reasonably well with the technology and um, we're used to teams, but clearly sometimes there's some technical hitches um, that we've got, so bear with us. We've also got um, some of our, our dental team uh, here, Janet Williams, in our Deputy Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and um, Sam Banger, who's our Head of Inspection, and they will be um, answering some of your questions as well uh, in the chat as we go through. Um, so just onto the next slide, um, our main purpose today is to talk about our transitional approach and also our future strategy. Um, we want this to be a productive session that you find uh, useful. Um, so we will do our best to stick to time and we also want to hear from you as much as possible. So although this is set up so you can't directly speak, uh, we can answer questions. And so please, during the time we're talking, put all of your questions in the chat function um, uh, that's available um, and we will endeavour to answer as many as possible that we can. The questions um, will be available afterwards and we will respond uh, to those ones we haven't been able to pick up uh, after the event. And also just to mention this event is being um, is being recorded uh, so we can upload it on our YouTube page um, for people who haven't been able to uh, come along today. Um, so uh, the next slide, um, please, Steph. Um, just wanted to iterate that our role and purpose has not changed. Um, we are the independent regulator of all health and adult social care services in England, and we absolutely make sure that health and social care services provide people with safe effective, compassionate, high quality care. Um, we also importantly encourage uh, services to improve. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that purpose because I think it is important and it has been particularly shown to be important during the pandemic. Um, I think uh, uh, regulation has been uh, played um, a role in making sure that services continue to deliver high quality care for people who use them. Um, so going on to the next slide, um, we know that um, an awful lot is changing. Pre-COVID, there was massive changes across the health and care landscape, um, new models of care, integrated care, um, primary care, care networks being developed, um, technology being used in many different ways. Um, and we've seen over the last few months with COVID how that has really accelerated even further. And that has really uh, solidified for us the importance in the fact that we need to change as well. If we're going to continue to deliver our purpose and enable um, improvement across the system, enable um, new models of care, new innovations to happen, we need to enable, we need to change to do that. Um, we don't want to be a barrier to innovations. We absolutely want to encourage them and we want to encourage that improvement. Um, we want the way we regulate to be simple, based on strong, open relationships with uh, providers um, and to be more effective. Uh, we want to focus our actions on areas that um, can have the biggest impact on people's experiences of care. We want to add as much value as a regulator as possible. So um, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, just so people are aware, we started our transformation of the CQC. So much of our thinking started back in the summer of last year. Clearly, a lot has changed since that time um, across the world, um, but we absolutely are keen to continue to change, continue to modernise what we do um, and continue to uh, develop so that we are absolutely fit for any future challenges. Um, and um, we're in the now phase at the moment um, and we will be talking about uh, the what we've done with the emergency support framework and the transitional regulatory approach um, and then 
we are going into the, the newer fa new phases of um, our development. Um, we will be consulting on our new strategy uh, from uh, January time next year, and uh, we plan to publish our new strategy and begin implementation uh, with immediate effect from May in 2021. So, I'm now going to hand over to John, who's going to take us through the transitional regulatory approach and what it really means for all of you. And then I'll come back later to talk about our strategy. So thank you, John, over to you. So thanks, thanks very much. And thanks, Rosie, for that for that so far despite all of my best efforts to prevent there being extraneous noise i've got some extraneous noise outside of our house which i hopefully won't um, won't detract too much from what we're uh, what we're attempting to say so during the months from april to september as many of you know we developed our emergency support framework and that was a telephone call which lasted roughly an hour it was intended to be supportive in nature. We were inquiring how practices were getting on. We were asking what changes practices were making to keep people safe and to keep their staff safe. We were also asking how practices were able to engage with the urgent dental care centres that have been set up through, throughout England. We asked about difficulties around PPE provision and we reflected those issues back to the Department of Health and, and via Rosie to ministers. We talked with over 400 dental practices and by and large the, um, the feedback we received from those emergency support framework calls has been very positive. And so we've taken that positivity um, as, as part of the process in moving to our transitional methodology which we're which we're beginning from now. So if we could change the slide again, please. So the risks about delivering care in in health and care settings during the pandemic are still with us. And so we're evolving our approach to regulation in a way that's sensitive to the to the changing circumstances of, of providers of dental care and, and all healthcare at the moment. We're keeping an eye just as much as I'm sure you are on the uh, on the levels of infection within the population and also the um, the high risk, medium risk and very high risk that, that our population is in at the moment. So our transitional regulation approach is bringing together elements of our existing methodology, our learning from how people have got on with the COVID response, and our overarching aim is to continually monitor how services can be, keep people safe and respond to changes with a light regulatory action. Um, we're also exploring our emerging strategic themes, and part of that is discussing how we will operate in terms of our future strategy with CQC. And some of you may already have seen, there's a draft strategy document from CQC out there. And during this regular, during this transitional phase that we're in at the moment, we're absolutely interested to hear what you've got to say. So could you change the slide again, please? So what we're doing with the, um, with the transitional regulatory approach at the moment is it will continue to be a telephone call. You might get the opportunity to use Teams or technology on that call, but what we'll be asking practices will be based on our existing key lines of inquiry. The five key questions that I know everybody has learned off by heart in the last few years and the points and prompts underneath those to enable us to monitor the safety of services. Where we do visit practices um, by crossing the threshold, um, that activity is likely to be more targeted and more focused on where we might have got concerns. We're not at the moment going to be returning to a routine programme of CQC visits, but we are in listening mode, thinking about how the transitional methodology that we're using at the moment might be adapted as the basis of, uh, of change 
moving forward. Could you change the slide again, please? So in response to the pandemic, as you know, we developed the emergency support framework and that helped us understand where there were where there were concerns in practices. It sometimes helped us realise where there might be risks of unsafe care and we were attempting to be supportive throughout this throughout throughout this process. Um, and our transitional approach as, as we go forward has been developed through engagement with uh, with with the dental profession and we, we're in the process at the moment of, of having lots of calls and we'll I'll, I'll refer to those later on later on in the process. Um, we're going to be focusing on safety, access and leadership, looking at areas such as infection prevention and control. Uh, of course, we're all aware that the, the coronavirus is still lurking within our population and uh, there'll be people attending our services who may be carrying the infection and don't actually know it. So it's really important that we build and maintain our strong relationships with providers. And the way that we're going to do that is through the regular calls from the transitional monitoring process. Could we uh, change the slide again, please? We'll be using all sorts of information going on as we go forward and there's been something called a, um, a provider collaboration review that you may have had some contact with and what we've been doing with those with those uh, elements of our work as we've been assessing to what extent uh, health services have lined up and collaborated within an, with one another so for example within dental practice the relationships of practices with the urgent dental care centres, the relationships of practices with NHS 111 in terms of getting patients with urgent needs, getting the care that they need. Um, other things have been how well sectors such as the care home have been able to access urgent dental care when they've needed it and also the effect on our hospital referrals and the like. And so we'll we'll be continuing that provider collaboration work. We'll be looking at urgent and emergency services in the next few weeks and also following on from that, we'll be looking at cancer services, including how oral cancer is, is dealt with. With dental services, we've been using a methodology where we look at 10% of practices each year. And over the last five years, we've looked at just over half of the dental practices in England. That's over 5,000. But that still meant that there have been 5,000 dental practices where there have been little engagement with CQC. And we believe that this is an area where we can be smarter and where we need to be assured that the care is of a high quality. So using our transitional methodology, we'll be looking at about 1,500 practices. Uh, there'll be a call of some sort which will last between one and one and a half hours. That's the basis of our approach. Um, also clear in, in our understanding is how those 1500 practices are prioritised. And so we'll be using information that we've got already. We'll also be taking account of information that's given to us by other services. But what probably one of the largest elements as to which practices get this call is going to be the length of time since we've had any contact contact with them. Um, so we're not just returning to business as usual. Um, the other thing that we'll be doing at the moment is trying to understand about people's experiences of care. And we've been getting information at the moment from Health Watch that people are having difficulty in getting access to dental care. So we'll be interested in hearing people's experience. We'll be talking with Health Watch about that. And probably in, in, in the next few weeks with the calls that we'll be making to practices, we will be asking the practices we contact what's access like for their patients. Are they able to are they are they able to deliver urgent care where it's needed? To what extent are they able to um, help with patients whose treatment was started but hasn't been able to be hasn't been able to be completed? Um, we have been receiving a lot of whistleblowing um, in CQC from dental practices where concerns have been raised about how practices are able to keep up with the 
uh, keep up with the guidance and protocols for infection prevention and control and stuff like that. So we're keeping our ears open. Can you uh, change the slide, please? Before we before we go on to the questions um, from you, um, the monitoring questions for dental providers are on our website. They follow the five key questions and the key lines of inquiry. Um, and also one of the things that we will be doing is exploring the use of technology on our calls. So when when the inspector calls you to say um, to fix an appointment for one of these transitional calls, they might ask you whether you, you want to participate using Teams or Zoom or things like that so that you can have a face to face conversation, which is a little bit more, uh, perhaps a bit more meaningful. So hopefully that takes us to the um, the end of this section and I think we may have some questions coming in already. Thanks John yes we've got a, got a few questions coming in so thanks for everyone for um, submitting those and please do carry on dropping them into the chat. Um, so one of the questions we've got, John, is is asking a bit more about the the Chloe's we're using at the moment during our transitional period. Could we say a bit more about what we're focusing on and, and why we've picked those? OK. The we're 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 focusing particularly on on safety and as part of safety we'll be will be um, taking a keen interest in in infection prevention and control as i said a few moments ago that's been the area where we've had concerns raised with us uh, both by a small number of patients but also by members of the dental team who are not at all comfortable about some of the circumstances in which they're working often that comes from perhaps not having having seen or understood the most relevant guidance that's out there and uh, practices need to know that public health england have, re have just recently issued an appendix specifically for dentistry on infection prevention and control during the pandemic so in our questions we'll be we'll be focusing on the five key questions whether um care is safe uh, safe, effective, caring, responsive and well led. I imagine that the the questions we will be asking more of will be to do with safety, mostly to do with cross infection prevention and control, as I would said. Also, we'll be majoring on leadership um, in terms of how we'll organise the practices, how well able people who are working in practices, how they understand what's expected of them in, in these in these difficult times. And things happen all the time, don't they? Just within the um, just within the practice where I work, um, we were asked we were asked today about a, a patient who saw us yesterday and has come up with a positive uh, a positive test today. There's lots of information around about what to do in that circumstance. But thinking you know it and then putting it into practice is a difficult thing. So we've had to, you know, we had to take a look quickly at what Public Health England that were advising so that we could take the correct action. Thanks, John. That's really helpful. Um, we've also got a question about how much notice the service will get before they have their uh, TMA call with us. Could we give a bit more detail about that? OK. Um, I'm not absolutely sure on the number of days or weeks the notice will be, but I know what will happen is that an inspector will call the practice and will discuss with you in the practice what the most appropriate and convenient time is. We're not in the place where we had two weeks notice as we had had with face-to-face uh, -face inspections. I'm hoping that somewhere in the chat uh, one of my colleagues is going to give a more definitive answer. Um, but as far as I'm aware, what we're expecting to do is you'll have a conversation. It'll be a mutually convenient time with our inspector and you in the practice. And also you'll have the opportunity to decide who within the practice is going to uh, come on that call. It may be it may be the registered manager um, and it may be there'll be one or two other staff members that you want to participate in that call at, at the appropriate time. Thanks, John. Um, we've also got some some questions about um, our inspection frequencies, um, and I think 
a bit of concern that as the situation with COVID might be seen as ramping up again, whether we're thinking about completely standing down our inspections. Um, could we say a bit what our approach is there in terms of visiting face to face? I think I think visiting face to face with with dental practices is is likely, particularly in the current climate, where as as we know the population infection rate is rising at the moment. I think the uh, the times when we will visit a practice will only be where we've exhausted other methods of assuring ourselves that the uh, that the practice has been able to deliver safe care. So um, we'll either be using this transitional model of, of a telephone call or if there are particular issues of concern that we think we can deal with um, remotely from the practice, we'll be exploring those avenues first. Um, we may we may still cross the threshold of a practice if we think the, um, the concerns are serious enough that we need to do that. Um, but we don't expect that to be very frequent. Rosie, do you want to comment on that? Um, I was just going to say, John, that um, throughout the first wave of the pandemic, although we stopped routine inspections, we didn't at any step time stop regulating and we did undertake some uh, risk based inspections all the way through. Um, and many of the problems we saw, not just in not in dental practice necessarily, but uh, um, more broadly, were not always related to the uh, COVID pandemic. And we, we followed up areas that uh, that were related to COVID, COVID and areas that weren't. And so actually we think it's important for um, patient safety and making sure they have access to good quality care that we continue to regulate and we um, we don't step back during um, during the second wave or during any future waves of the pandemic. But we do make sure that uh, the approach that we take is as proportionate as possible and that we um, will be fully aware. We are fully aware of, of the massive pressure that uh, all providers across health and social care are under at the moment and we are taking that into account in all of our actions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks both. Um, just building on what you were talking about earlier, John, about providers working together in a system, we've got a question about um, dental services interacting with adult social care services and just asking if we've got any plans to encourage um, dental support to still be available to adult social care and um, and to talk a bit about the work we do in that area. OK, well, thank you. Well, as many of you know, last year we produced a report called Smiling Matters and um, that was to do with oral health in the care home setting. Many of us in the dental profession are aware that when people enter residential care, uh, often the oral health can deteriorate for for all sorts of reasons. And so what we did from CQC was we um, we said that from our side, in terms of the regulation of adult social care, we would begin asking questions within the care home environment when we do our inspections there, what providers do to look after the oral health of people that they look after. And, 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 and in itself, that was quite a catalyst for change. And so the care home sector has been uh, has been seeking training opportunities for their staff and also trying to build relationships with dental practices. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, the, the COVID pandemic has completely got in the way of that, particularly in, in terms of the limitations for those who are able to visit care homes at this time. But we don't want to forget the good work that's gone on. And what we're aware of is that um, Public Health England are producing a whole suite of training materials um, for care homes and for dental staff. We're expecting that to be published in the next few weeks and we're quite excited about that because it looks looks really good. Um, equally well, um, we understand that under the guise of flexible commissioning, NHS England is starting to think about whether dental practices can interact in a more meaningful way with some of the care homes on their patch. We think it's a really important area at CQC. We'll be uh, we'll be following it up over over the next year because we recognise it's important that oral care is good 
for people in residential care. It can affect their quality of life, it can affect their comfort and it can affect their dignity. So it's not something we're going to, we're, we're going to lose sight of. Um, it is just a little bit tricky at the moment though because of the particular pressures that the pandemic is, is giving, particularly for care homes. Thanks, John. That's really helpful. Um, we've also got a question asking about the TMA calls and whether we'll ask to uh, ask a provider to share their screen to show us any patient records. OK, that's a that's a really interesting question. And I think if if um, if if it were to be helpful, um, we would be happy about that about that taking place. I think that depends on a discussion between the inspector on the day and you in the practice. It's not an expectation of ours that people will be uh, necessarily sharing their screens and, and sharing patient records in that way. But if it's helpful, we, we, we're open to that suggestion. And certainly going forward to the um, any changes in methodology from from I think it's around about May next year. We're having lots of consultation with dental practices at the moment. And one of the questions that we're asking of the dental profession is how how the dental profession feels about whether um, screen sharing and examining patient records in this sort of way will help us understand how effective the care is that's being given to the public. So for us at the moment, it's, it's an open question. There's been a pilot running with um, general medical practitioners about this, which Rosie might be able to tell you more about. Yes, I can just explain. Um, so with GP practices, we've been um, running a pilot of about 30 practices uh, looking at how we can access medical records um, where appropriate and with a practice's consent um, to, to undertake work without having to go on site uh, to minimise the impact on the practice. Um, and essentially we've started with looking at a, a set of structured searches, um, looking at medication um, processes and things like that through the um, through the clinical records and then done a deeper dive into individual patient records as required to follow up uh, the the areas we're looking at. Um, we do have um, a, a legal right to access um, medical records but we clearly we want to do that um, in line with all of the correct guidance and correct GDPR uh, requirements and everything else um, and we would always do that with um, with the, the provider understanding what we were doing and when we were going to be accessing those uh, those records. Yeah, and the early uh, the early feedback we've had from the discussions we've had with several groups around dentistry at the moment have been positive. Um, I think uh, um, what what people have been saying to us is that this this will enable us to reduce the time that we spend in practice if we're on a visit, and uh, provided it's done safely and carefully, as Rosie's just been saying, it's an interesting possibility going forwards. Thanks both. Um, so we've also got quite a popular question asking um, about the kind of evidence we'd look for on a TMA call that a provider can share to help demonstrate their meeting the regulations. Um, I know Sam Banker has answered in the chat, but I just wondered if there was anything you wanted to say more on that, John, about the kind of things we'd want to see in one of those calls. Well, I think primarily the the, the call itself, it's a transitional monitoring process rather than rather than um, a substitute inspection done over the phone and particularly in this next few months. Um, in terms of evidence, I think if it if it occurs during the call that it will be helpful for us to receive evidence, um, we'd, we'd find a way for people to be able to send that to us digitally. Um, sometimes something might be able to be you might be able to show us something on a call if it was a Zoom call or a Teams call, um, but that's the way that's the way that we're thinking. But in general, this is a com this is most likely to be a conversation similar to the ESF calls were, and any evidence that's needed, uh, one way or another, needs to be discussed with the inspector. Is that what Sam put in his answer? It's pretty pretty close, John. Yes. Thank you. Pretty um, close. <laughs> 
just conscious of time, I think maybe if we if we take one more question now and then we can um, pick up the other questions in the second Q and A session. But we've got we've got one here that's asking about our view on um, patient access to dental services during COVID and whether this is something we're looking at and we have any information about. Well, the. In, in terms of information, what we know, there's a lot of noise about dental access at the moment. Healthwatch have been sharing with us the concerns that they've been they've been receiving at local level. And we understand that Healthwatch are going to produce a report about access into dentistry um, in, in the next month or two. Um, I think what people need to understand is that we in CQC do understand why there might be issues with access in dentistry. First of all, um, practices uh, restricted the services that they were offering in the first six months or so. Um, they were doing telephone calls and triage and things like that and weren't open for routine care. And that was to keep people safe. Um, when practices eventually opened from, from the 8th of June onwards, um, the need to put fairly stringent infection prevention control measures in place and also to um, the term fallow time was being used for where aerosol generating procedures were being carried out. You needed to let the surgery um, rest for a while to let any uh, any virus particles settle and then for the surgery to be thoroughly cleaned. So the capacity for, for dental surgeries to provide the the normal amount of care to patients that they were able to was considerably diminished and remains so because there are still lots of precautions that need to be taken. So we understand that the capacity has fallen. Although it's rising again, we know it'll take a good while before it, it returns anywhere near to 100% capacity, if it ever does. And so we understand that some of the difficulties patients will have in getting access is um, is a structural issue. Um, we're going to be considering the access issues over the next few few weeks with um, in in um, in conjunction with our general practice colleagues. We're thinking about ac access. We're going to discuss those issues with um, with health ministers, and we're going to think we're going to think carefully about what might need to change in the future to enable the public to get access to the care that they need. Access hasn't just fallen in NHS practice, it's fallen in private practice as well. And so it's an area of considerable interest to us. And of course, it's it's of interest to the population. If you're struggling to get dental care or struggling to get your treatment completed when you started treatment may back in January or February, that's clearly um, clearly can have an effect on people's oral health going forwards. Thank you, John. Um, and just to say uh, thanks for everyone who's put questions in. Please do keep adding them and we'll have some time at the end of the call to to answer some more questions. But if I hand over to Rosie to take us through some slides about our future strategy. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, John. I just want to talk a little bit about where we think we're going as an organisation at the CQC over the next few years. Um, we are developing our future strategy, um, and as we said earlier, this is looking to uh, be published in May of next year. And there's going to be four key themes I just want to briefly touch on um, this afternoon. So one is around people, one is about smarter regulation, one is about safety, and one is about our role in improvement. And I think what fundamentally underlies our new strategy is the fact that we want to change people's lives for the better and use our, our um, influence and our regulation to be able to do that. So if we could go on to the next slide, please, um, Steph. Um, so in terms of our people aspect, uh, we feel that we ought to regulate through the eyes of people who use services. We want to very much hear from people who use services, get feedback on the great care they receive, on the care that's not so good, um, and use that to help us understand what's happening within services. Um, and also families, carers of people who use services as well. Um, 
we also need to make sure that we have the tools and the, the feedback that enables us to truly put people at the centre of what we do and to be able to feed back to them once we've actually done something with the information that they tell us. Um, so that's a really key theme of our, our future strategy that we want to uh, get people's views on. We're very worried at the moment. Uh, we've always been worried about inequalities. I think we're particularly concerned about inequalities and widening inequalities at the moment with what's happening with the pandemic. Uh, we want to strengthen our work to reduce inequalities and do everything that we possibly can as a regulator to, um, to address some of those inequalities in the health and care um, system. So um, that's going to be a key focus of what we do. Um, and we want to also look at how people's experience of care, um, how how that happens as they use different services and move between those services. We know that for many people, um, they don't just access one service. They don't just go along to their dentist or their GP or the hospital or social care. And we've already talked about the Smiling Matters work earlier and how important actually um, providers working together is to make sure that uh, people get good quality of care as they move between, uh, between the services. Um, we understand that the voice of patients is not always heard in terms of dental services and we are really keen to um, engage, uh, find different ways of engaging with the public about their experiences and their expectations of oral care as part of this. So if we could move to the next slide, which is about uh, smarter regulation. So we've heard over the years um, that there's been concerns about consistency in our ratings um, and that our current approach can sometimes mean that the overall rating of a service um, can mask concerns in individual areas. Um, we've heard from our stakeholders that there's strong support for the con continued use of inspection in our regulatory work, but uh, with a clear um, message that this should be more um, targeted. Um, so we are developing plans to look at how we evolve our ratings programme across all of the sectors to make sure it's up to date, meaningful, and it focuses most to uh, most on what matters to patients um, and we also are trying to the tra transitional regulatory approach that John has just talked to you about is, is one way of testing a much more targeted approach. Um, specifically in dental we're intending to collect and share information digitally where possible. Uh, we want to, to reduce the time on site looking at policies and hope to do this more remotely. Um, during the pandemic, we will remain flexible in how we operate to minimise um, any impact that we have on inspection on providers whilst we continue to gain assurance of uh, services that they are being provided uh, safely. So if we could go on to the next slide, which is about safety. And um, I, I was shocked last year at a patient safety event, um, although probably um, not hugely surprised that Unavo uh, that avoidable harm in health and care is actually one of the top 10 killers in the world still in 2020. Um, we've still got massive work to do in this area um, and we are making some steps but not quickly enough in, in our mind in terms of um, minimising avoidable harm. Um, we know that having a really good culture in an organisation can help with that. So how are people able to speak up about their concerns? How do they talk about things that haven't gone well? How do they learn from those things that haven't gone well? Um, and how do they then put steps in place so th those things don't happen again? And those are really, really important for us. Um, so safety culture um, and uh, what safe looks like, particularly in different population groups, is something that we um, we absolutely want to uh, to look at. Um, and so I know that in dental safety has always been a very important element um, of our regulation. Uh, process um, and more than ever as, as John was talking about it's especially important at this time when we've got a viral infection with uh, potentially fatal consequences. Um, so we're going to be taking um, an interest in IPC both in terms of project protecting staff but also the public as they receive care in the dental setting and we want to work with you to look at what we can do to promote those really good patient safety cultures. And finally, I just wanted to talk about improvement um, and uh, 
look at how do we make sure if we could go on to the next slide, please, Steph. Um, how do we make sure that uh, people get a consistent improvement offer um, and that we enable all, all parts um, of every sector to improve? Um, those that are really good to enable them to continue to improve and drive that improvement culture that, that continues to, to stretch and innovate and um, develop services for their patients. But also, how do we make sure that those um, providers that are struggling, that are not, um, not uh, finding it more difficult that are starting to wobble or starting to deteriorate. And we know that that can happen very quickly for a whole variety of reasons. How do we make sure that they can get quick access to help and support? Support. Um, and that's something that um, we're exploring and we're looking at how we can develop an improvement alliance with partner organisations um, and uh, look at how we can then directly link our improvement offer to this. Um, we're really keen that we take a much more active leadership role in driving improvement. I think the Smiling Matters work that John referenced earlier was a great example of how if we work collaboratively with all of our partners, we can really drive improvement um, right across the sectors and um, how we can how we can change things and particularly those areas that have been neglected or not talked about how do we really shine a light on those to really make sure that things move forward um, so just in terms of the next slide just uh, to summarize that what we're doing next um, is that uh, we will be carrying out inter iterations and developments to our transitional approach and we are really keen to get feedback from yourselves about how the process is operating. Um, our smarter approach will only be brought to fruition if we really understand how well our transitional approach is operating. Um, we want to be that uh, have that improvement culture ourselves and build on um, learning, improving and continuing to work to make sure that we do things in the best way we possibly can. Um, at the current time, we're talking to a lot of representative groups of the whole dental profession. Uh, this webinar is part of that process and our intention is to seek and hear your views and options to inform the more formal consultation that will happen in the new year. Um, we know this isn't all going to happen overnight um, and we're very open to possibility of modifying our methodology. So please, please do stay in touch with us and we'll tell you how at the end of this, um, uh, the end of this webinar. And finally, um, just uh, just moving on um, to the future, um, we want to build really strong relationships with you all. Um, our credibility as a regulator is partly built on our strong relationships with providers um, as well as the public that receive care. And um, we want to uh, work with you as we publish our future strategy and uh, put it into practice. Um, so we will be continuing to connect on a regular basis through uh, blogs through bulletins through webinars um, and sharing what we're doing but uh, in in the meantime as I said please do continue to feedback and uh, we have a slide at the end with all of the different ways of doing that so um, I think it's time now for any final questions so over to you Sam Hey, thanks, Rosie. Um, so we've got a we've got a few questions about fallow time in the chat. Um, so one about uh, what we'll be looking for in practice is what we'd expect to see, um, and how we'll be assessing what um, whether what practice is doing is appropriate. And then a second question about whether we'd expect to see ventilation systems within practices. Um, John, is this one you you want to pick up? Oh, you're on mute, John. You're on mute, John. I was thinking of passing that one on to Rosie. No, only teasing. Um, yeah, fallow time. It, it's, it, it plays a huge part in how quickly practices are able to return to something even approaching normality. And we do understand the difficulties uh, that have been there. But there's been a lot of work being done by the Scottish Dental Clinical Effectiveness Programme. Um, and their work was published about two to three weeks ago. The Faculty of uh, General Dental Practice has produced some guidance and only this week uh, Public Health England produced their guidance about infection prevention control, including including issues around fallow time. So what are we expecting from the CQC? I think the first thing that we're expecting is that we're expecting practices to think about the issue carefully. The way that I phrased it is if you're the next 
if you're the next patient in the room following on from a patient who was infectious but you didn't know it how would you feel if you were that patient coming into the room think about that in terms of how you uh, how you develop your mechanisms for keeping keeping patients safe so the guidance that's just been produced talks about if you've got various things in play such as good ventilation um, that the fallow time can be reduced to uh, 15 minutes or so following um, if you've got I think six to ten air changes per hour. So we'd expect practices to be thinking about the air changes per hour in their surgery. You may need to get some professional advice on that issue. Um, and I think what we would be expecting is you to have thought it carefully, thought through it carefully, taken advice um, and moving on to the issue about ventilation. It's clear from the guidance that's been produced that there's been a hierarchy of, uh, of protections and uh, good ventilation seems to be to the forefront in, in um, diluting the number of viable virus particles is the, perhaps the best way that I can describe it. So if you've got good ventilation, it quickly dilutes those particles that might be in the air and reduce the risk of people in, in coming into the surgery next, inhaling them. I think we do pretty well in terms of protecting ourselves and our staff using the PPE that's available. And again, there's guidance in the um, in the infection prevention control annex that was just produced in the last few days about what the right PPE is under the right circumstances. We do recognise that it's going to take some time for practices to install ventilation equipment if they need to do it. Do it carefully, take professional advice. The British Dental Industry Association um, will be able to help you and there are all sorts of regulations around building and electricians and the like which will also help you to get this process get this process right um i think my my best advice would be um and until you're certain about your ventilation or any other measures you're taking to reduce risk um then follow the follow the guidance from public health england about fallow times thanks john um Looking to our future approach, we've also had a question about ratings in dental services and whether this is something we're thinking about. Um, Rosie, John, I don't know which one of you wants to. Well, pick well I'll kick off and then, and then Rosie can, can, can come in if she needs to. The dental services are one of the um, almost the only service in C that CQC regulates that isn't rated. Um, I was around when the original discussions were being held about ratings and the ratings was to do with also to do with the frequency that we inspected uh, dental practices and in an environment where currently we've been ex inspecting only 10 percent of practices per year a rating system didn't seem to fit in too fairly with that um, at the moment what we're doing with the dental groups that we're speaking to is we're asking whether there is any benefit in rating dental practices that benefit might be to the public in having uh, un understanding how they can make choices between different dental providers if they need to rating seems to work well in the care home sector um, we're also asking the question whether there might be a benefit of rating for providers in terms of uh, how it helps them work through an improvement process if things are if things are not so good or equally well if they're really good a rating system gives credit to those practices um, which, which which is useful for them as well as giving huge confidence to the patients who attend those services so where we are with ratings is at the moment we're asking the question we haven't made our mind up one way or the other whether to introduce ratings in dentistry um, there's been a fair amount on the social media in the last week or two since we've opened this question up for people's opinions um, opinions are every bit as varied now as they were five or six years ago when we first started discussing the ratings program so we haven't made our mind up and we are listening rosie do you want to comment 
Yes, thank you, John, and, and completely agree. Um, this is something that is work in progress. We want to hear people's views. I think we know from the public with our other sectors that we uh, regulate that they do uh, find value in the ratings in helping them choose providers and helping understand the quality of the care. And I think one of the considerations that we need to think about is when we've got more complex providers who are offering a multiple of different services how do we how do we manage that if some parts are, are rated and um, dental isn't uh, but I think the um, that there's a lot of uh, uh, pros and cons either way so I think that is something we want to rate and uh, want to work out over the next few months and I would say that actually part of our, our transitional regulatory approach in our other sectors is looking at how we deal with ratings um, over the next few months uh, during the pandemic so it is something we are actively discussing. Thanks both. Um, We've also had some questions around PPE in dental services. Um, so one of those is about whether we um, we would recommend anywhere to go to find the best and most up to date guidance on what PPE is appropriate. And also a question about the disc uh, a potential discrepancy between PPE in private dental services and NHS dental services and whether that's something we're aware of or have any concerns about? Well, I think the I think the first thing that I would say on this particular subject is Public Health England have got loads and loads of guidance of the appropriate PPE for dental practices um, and the, the latest stuff that was produced two or three days ago um, that contains that advice. Uh, the Faculty of General Dental Practice they too have got advice as as have the BDA and these are all credible places to to get that advice. I don't personally see why there would be any difference in PPE in the private se sector or within NHS dental practice. I don't think the coronavirus uh, cares which setting it's in. So think about the protection of your staff and also the protection of the public. Thanks, John. Um, We've also got a quite a general question about um, what we think um, COVID has taught us or shown us about oral health. Is there anything we've learned about oral health or dental services during the pandemic that we didn't know before? Well, well, I'll start. I'll start off with one, and then it'd be interesting to see what Rosie thinks about this. Um, the COVID, the COVID pandemic first of all brought lots of challenges for, for, for the dental profession because people were in, were finding it difficult to access urgent care and the profession rallied around really quickly to staff the urgent the urgent dental care centers sometimes where those urgent dental care centers were not uh, were not available practices made themselves avail available with their staff to treat people with urgent needs so the profession has worked well a good number of people within the dental profession threw themselves into the general um, COVID process. Some were working um, in helping set up the Nightingale centres, others worked in A&E, others worked in intensive care units. The dental profession where they had the right skills were able to offer themselves to the wider health community and I think that was to the credit of uh, credit of the dental profession. Others got involved in uh, um, in test and trace things and and stuff like that. Um, in in terms of oral health, um, I think just the the fact that care was became rather more difficult to get because of the changes practices were having to make, has perhaps brought for the public a focus on oral health that we could perhaps capitalise on going forwards. Um, so those are the first thoughts that I've got. I don't know if Rosie's got any more. Yes, I've, I've got a few thoughts as well. Actually, one is that um, <laughs> stating the obvious, but how important um, access to, to dental services are. I think we um, we all heard a, a few very um, difficult stories about people who couldn't access um, uh, access um, dental care and um, during the, the height of the pandemic. And I think it just highlighted to all of us how important uh, good access is. Um, I think 
Second thing I just wanted to mention was the work we did with the provider collaboration reviews. And if you haven't had a look at it, we did publish our state of care report um, a couple of weeks ago, which is on our website. And it's got a chapter in it which talks about our findings of our first 11 provider collaboration reviews. And we looked at 11 systems um, and looked at the care of the over 65s between um, uh, health and social care. Um, we're going on now to look at urgent emergency care in another eight systems. And uh, then after that, it will be cancer, mental health and learning disability. So looking at a broad range of different areas. But we did um, specifically look at how um, the interactions between um, dental teams and the rest of the health and care system uh, were going. And I think one of the things I noticed um, was that it would be really great to see uh, more discussion about um, oral health at the integrated care system boards and uh, for it to be given more of a, a priority um, through those systems. I know when we spoke to many system leaders um, they hadn't really made those connections um, and they it was something that um, wasn't really uh, being considered within the integrated care system, despite the fact that um, we know that actually oral health is important for every member of the population. And actually, when things like there isn't the access to, to dental care, it can have an impact on other parts of the system, such as A&Es and, um, and GPs and uh, various other places where people will not get their needs met in the same way as, as having access to good dental care. So um, I think going forward, I think it's a really interesting area. I'm keen to think about how do we how do we look at um, the integrated care agenda and how do we really make sure that oral health is um, is uh, a key part of that, um, given its importance. And I think the final thing just to mention is inequalities. I think that um, I don't think we fully understand the impact of COVID as yet on, um, on inequalities, but we know from all the signals that we've had that there have been a significant um, significant cause for concern around those widening inequalities um, and uh, and access to care. Um, so I think that's something that I think we do need to to work on and to look at and make sure that everyone has um, has the, the appropriate care that they need. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Rosie. And, and it's there's some really interesting suggestions in the chat about um, how dental professionals can work in settings like care homes and other other health and social care settings that we'll we'll definitely take into our conversations. Um, maybe we've got time for maybe just one more question. Um, there's there's a bit of a general question about how in our future st strategy things like how Chloe's might change or the areas we focus at, focus on or look at in dental services might change in the future. Um, do we want to say anything about that quickly? Well, we, we are. So we are in if I... go on. Go on, Sorry, go on, John. OK, well, well, I was just going to say, so the five key questions are not are not going to change. Um, so we, we think the um, safe, effective, responsive, caring and well led are important for us to look like. But the key lines of inquiry, we're trying to slim down so that uh, we can really focus on the areas that are important and they will be very available on our website for people to see. Um, uh, John, do you want to add to that? Yeah, we've been some of the conversations we've been having already with representative groups um, we've been asking this question and safety is top of everybody's priority, um, not just because of the pandemic still being lurking around us. Um, the, the other one that people are really interested in is is effective care. Um, and so we'll be thinking about our, our, our questions around effective care and how we can through our inspection process or through our regulatory process however it ends up in the in in the next year how we can look at whether care is effective the the way that i sometimes articulate this in 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 conversation is um can i be confident that my mum will get the care she needs to improve her oral health and maintain her oral health when she engages with the dental practice that she might go to um, that that's a simplistic way of putting it um, but we think it's an important area for us to cover at, at cqc thanks john um and thanks rosie um are you okay just to wrap things up and do the last slide 
Was that to me or to Rosie? I think if you put you the last it, slide John. on. I'll go for it. I'll go for it. <laughs> OK. Let's change the slide over. Brilliant. Um, so I hope you've understood from the way we've been talking so far that we recognise at CQC that we need to change. We um, we also know that we can't just change and do things to you. We want to do things with you. And so it's important that you speak with us so you can get involved. We've got a digital platform called Citizen Lab. Um, we send you our provider bulletins and, and things like that. You can sign up for those if you don't already get them. Um, and we've got a Twitter account, which I have to say at the moment I'm not engaged with, but perhaps there's a message to myself there. And also we've got podcasts and things like that on CQC Connect. There are lots of ways in getting, getting in touch with us. We hope we'll use them. We hope you will share with us your thoughts about how CQC develops in the future, because we think that's the that's the best way for a regulator to work and for a regulator be, to be one in which the public have got confidence in us and our judgments, but also that those of us in the profession also share that confidence. So thanks so much for taking part in today's webinar. Thank you.